Read that off. And you need your chairs up here. After the first written question, we'll take a, a question from the audience. So if there's someone out there that's thinking about an oral question. of questions so um, what are the cancer rates slash deaths for silica and, and where to find stats uh, the best source the best source of exposure or the best source of information is NIOSH the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health they actually regulate and uh, catalog deaths from silica and uh, whether they be silicosis, <laughs> tuberculosis, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or lung cancer. So those would be cataloged. You can start looking for OSHA or MSHA as keywords in the search, but it's the NIOSH, the organization that actually tracks the number of people in industry who die from silicosis, lung cancer, etc., related to silica exposure. Okay, here's a... In the town of Howard Ordinance, uh, I read through that, and I was curious as to how you uh, chose the months that you could haul. It seemed like uh, some of it overlapped uh, spring breakup. Well, the real problem that uh, companies that are in rural towns have is... Uh, the closure of heavy traffic on roads during that six week, normally six week period, I think spring thaw. Um, um, EOG has to operate. So EOG is not itself a sand mining company. It's the largest domestic oil and gas mining company in the country. It's, it, it, in fact, it's, it's now going to be strictly crude oil uh, and um, they're getting out of the gas drilling business entirely, and uh, and they they uh, they have certain standards in their business plan. Uh, for example, they will not mine a site that has more than thirty percent waste. They need to have seventy percent target material in order to profit to to mine it and process it and ship it profitably. Um, so, and the, so they have to do this 365 years because they're not in the business of selling sand. They're in the business of using sand themselves, and they're, they've got a big stake uh, in the South Texas and Western Texas oil fields um, where this stuff is being shipped. They're doing a lot of mining down there. Uh, in fact, the town of Fort Worth, the city of Fort Worth, which is where their home office is, they've got 200 wells right in town frack sand wells right in town. Um, so they need this stuff, they need this stuff badly. Um, so what they, what they are doing, uh, they need an all season road. And B, which is just a corridor road, a county road, uh, that's just an ag road with ag, you know, ag machinery limits on it. So they have to rebuild that road too. And the, the taxpayer County says, no, you're not going to foist all that cost on the taxpayer. They, they got a, a federal and state shared funding for a mile of it. The last next four miles, DOG is going to have to rebuild at the cost of $9 million to themselves. So what they wanted to do was haul from other sites. In fact, up in uh, Barron County, in the town of Ireland, they've got a 375-acre mine site from which they will be hauling eventually. They've got another site in Cooks Valley, which is uh, over around 200 acres, the so-called Dennis Schindler site, which is we, they will be hauling uh, down this down this road. But they want this mine. They want to mine out of the Howard site mine during that thaw period because they have an all-season road they can drive on. 
Now that was a very, now keep in mind, they didn't know this. They didn't know anything about, they're from Texas. <laughs> they didn't know about cold weather. They didn't know about spring thaws. And so their, their business plan was in constant flux. We had, a, we had agreed to things that we had to change their mind on because we were willing to negotiate in good faith with them and they with us. And so, you know, some things kept changing because as they started negotiating with the county, holy crap, we discovered we can't drive on that road for six months. Well, now the county, now they started negotiating with the county to get an all-season road in there. Well, they got it, but they had to pay for it themselves. Now the interesting thing is there was a major company prospecting next door and called up EOG and said, who's that company prospecting next? By God, they're not going to be driving on our road. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like a little town government there for a minute. <laughs> but, but they aren't calling in the summertime. No, That's no. We, well, because we agreed, we agreed, I mean, this is all, right, quid pro quo type thing. We agreed that they would haul no more than 600,000 tons a year out of this site because they've got other sites to haul from. So we thought if with all these people living around the site, they're not outside in the wintertime, right? They don't want to have their windows open with dust blowing through and noise of trucks driving in and out. Mind you, they're going to be 550 trucks a day driving up and going that way and 550, that's 1,100 trucks trips back and forth. A day, excepting for those two hours in the morning at night where school busing occurs. I have a, a related question here. Um, One second, Jeremy. Oh. Can I ask the members of the panel, please address your answers in one minute? No. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank where do citizens voice concerns over transportation and traffic complaints? How does one identify the source of trucks involved? Do I have to answer this one too? <laughs> um, I will be limited by what I don't know on this question. Um, the town roads have jurisdiction only over town roads. Now your jurisdiction, basically you have weight limits. Most town roads are what are called class B roads, which means that there's an upper limit of the amount of tonnage uh, they, can, uh, they can carry. A heavy, heavy uh, 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 trucks, that might be let's say septic trucks and, and sometimes grain trucks, they can get special permits to travel in excess of the weight limits for the road, provided that it's done very infrequently and on one occasion, but not on a 1,100 trucks a day kind of deal. So there are ways of permitting overload trucks on Class B roads uh, with special permit. But anything but your leverage uh, with the company on, on roads is weight limits. You can simply say, look, you can haul a dump truck over this 1,100 times a day, but you can't get any, well, they can't operate that way. So that's when you start getting into road agreements, where you start saying, well, uh, a ton of Greenfield, for example, gets 75 cents a ton per uh, raw material or per target material. I don't remember just exactly which it is. They negotiated that with the town. and But that, that that, that money has to put in, be in escrow and only used to repair that road. Can't be used for you know, deferring taxes or anything else. And, and if we ever get a severance tax in, the, tax in the state, the company says, well, then all this road tax goes away. The road money goes away. But see, the town of Greenfield had no leverage. That's why you need an ordinance. Do we have any live questions? Okay. Here, Linda. Yes, um, I recently listened to a hydrologist who stated that we have one aquifer in this area. Now, if the farmers are pulling on it, maybe 90%, and these people are pulling, what's left? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an engineer, not a hydrogeologist, but uh, and I didn't hear the same uh, claim that she made about one single aquifer. Was this on the, the 
public radio show? No, no, he gave us a presentation on um, CDLR, <coughs> and I, um, I'm going to assume you know what he was talking about. Yeah. So, what then? Excuse me, Neil Cook, who's a retired hydrologist that worked for the government, he lives here, and he, I heard the same presentation. Okay. He said that, that John Conway has a sand aquifer. It's in the sandstone, rather, and it's one aquifer under kind of the whole, whole county, whole area, and you pollute it. Yeah, I, I was familiar with the rust. I, I wouldn't say if you pollute one part of it, the whole aquifer in Rust County or Dunn County is going to be polluted. It's, it's going to create a plume and it's going to go towards the nearest discharge area, the Red Cedar River. And I think that's maybe where that that went. Yeah, yeah. You're not going to you're not going to pollute the entire aquifer of, in Dunn County. I'm not gonna say, I know that as a fact. We've got lots of little contaminated sites on that are that are local and have localized contaminants. Were you talking more about the groundwater quantity though, weren't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, all I can say is that when we do our, when somebody comes in for a high capacity well permit, we, by law, look at those things that are up there. We'll look at the impact of a nearby municipal well. If the city of Menominee had a well that was out by Fairmont, and Fairmont wanted to put in another well, we'd look at the impact of the Fairmont well on that. Um, the Chippewa County actually is doing, is, is trying to start a major groundwater study that's going to look at all groundwater withdrawals and their impact on other wells, groundwater levels, uh, levels in streams and stuff, and that should be good information to have. But right now, um, we don't do that type of review. I had heard that. I Yes, this is to Mr. Bodinger. Bodinger? That uh, you add chemicals to the sand after you mine it. How many? I had heard like three to four hundred different kinds of chemicals. No, no, we do not add any chemicals to the sand after we mine it. Well, and where do the chemicals come from that I heard were added? Some from rumors. <laughs> you don't add any no. chemicals? In the fracking. Yeah, we're 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 a industrial sand company. We supply sands, raw sands, to the oil and gas market uh, for their use. We I'm don't actually use. have anything to do with the actual application of the sand in the well in the fracturing process. So what comes out of our what comes out of the facilities in the dry plant is a dried sand. It's a clean sand because that's essentially one of the quality specs that we have is we have to wash the sand, we have to dry the sand, and then we have to separate it into different size fractions. And then that sand, sand is essentially raw sand that's just been cleaned. And then that is shipped out directly to our customers. What they do with it at that point, you know, as far as the fracturing process, that's their business. So I don't know anything as far as the um, chemicals that you're referring to that are added to the sand. Rich, could I ask you to talk about a resin, a resin coating that I know a lot of folks do use? Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the chemicals that are used in that yeah, process? Resin, resin coating is a process that uh, after the sand, the raw sand could then, you know, as, as the mines that I manage in Wisconsin, we do not have resin coating facilities at, at our plants, uh, but we do, Fairmont does operate resin coating facilities uh, within Illinois, uh, Texas, um, uh, also Mexico, and Michigan. And the process is essentially uh, a coating that's put on the sand. The sand is essentially sent through a, a tumbling process and a mixing process. And it's a, um, um, a resin. There's several different types of resin because there's several different types of applications. Uh, that resin essentially makes the grain rounder and it makes it harder, it increases strength. And some of our customers uh, require certain specs uh, that the raw sand cannot produce on its own. So therefore, we will add a, a coating to it. Uh, so, but as far as Wisconsin industrial sand, we do not do that uh, at any of our facilities here in Wisconsin. I'm not familiar, I'm just familiar with the process because I've witnessed it. I'm not exact, I'm not familiar with the actual uh, coating uh, components itself. But somewhere along the line, our good, clean sand is going to be with chemicals that are going to harm somebody's something. Yeah. Somebody's going to have to pay for it. 
I, I can't comment on the chemicals and if they harm anybody at all. So. I'm just making you know, comments if people think about that. Okay, I have several questions about uh, the amount of gallons that are used at the, at the okay. sand mines um, and what where that water ends up going if it goes back uh, or how it's reclaimed water. If anyone knows that. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. As far as as far as the process, um, sand is mined from the bedrock geology. Uh, if you notice that the, the couple of the pictures that I that I showed was a mine in development. Um, that the different colors and the different gradations within the sand, whether it's uh, has clays, silts, um, it's a fine sand or a coarse sand. It has to go through a process. Uh, which where we actually wash the sand. We send the sand through an, an industrial washing machine. Uh, we add water and then we take the water away. We add clean water and take the water away again. Um, the systems that we have set up right now are, are designed to uh, maximize water recycling. Um, I heard uh, uh, Ron talk about uh, polymer usage in um, water treatment. Uh, what that polymer is used to do is to uh, essentially maximize the water recycling. It uh, creates an ionic bond between uh, the particles of clay and fine sand and essentially cleans the water and returns it directly back into uh, the plant for use. So when we're talking about using the high capacity wells, we're talking about using the wells only to make up water. Uh, make up water due to evaporation, make up water due to uh, the removal of the water from the sand as it goes to the dryer before it goes into the dry processing plant. So a lot of uh, misconception is, is that we have the wells on full throttle all the time and then the water is, is essentially being wasted. We have uh, very tight loop systems where we recycle water. So our high cap, high cap well uh, permits state that we can only pump a certain limit um, and every year uh, we're finding ways to decrease our actual usage and our Menominee facility uh, in particular has two high capacity wells and we've been able to knock that down to a third of what we uh, used during our first year of operation through improved technology. I think you sort of explained um, the question that this lady had down here. You were saying that the end product is clean sand, but what about the sand? I mean, you're, you're certainly there's a mixture of uh, products that have to be removed from that sand. In other words, the clay and all of that kind of thing. To clean it, you use you must use the flocculant uh, added to the water, and the end product is going to be the clean sand, and also the um, the sand that's not any good with the flocculants. Um, I think that needs to be clarified because what happens with those flocculants in, in the, the product that you can't use? What do you do with it? Right, the, um, the, what we refer to the jargon in the industry is called tailings. Um, it's the clays, the silts, the fine sands that are washed out, dirts, whatever it may be, that are washed out of the sand. They're accumulated into uh, what we have in Menominee in particular is, is called a thickener tank, and it's very, very much the same technology as a water treatment facility, just a sewage uh, treatment facility. It's a round tank. It has a rake in the bottom that takes um, the clay, in this case, and fine sands, down into the middle of the tank, and then they're pumped into uh, the mine where they're used for reclamation. The polymers that we use are used, uh, are added to the water as the tailings, all the wastewater, dirty water, clays, fine sands, are entering into this uh, thickener tank. And it's the exact same process as uh, a water treatment facility. Um, the clarifiers and the thickener tanks are used and, and actually result in drinking water. There's polymers that, the same polymers that are used in uh, drinking water facilities, uh, water treatment facilities. My understanding that the water treatment facilities use a, a much higher concentration of polymers than we use within the mining facilities. Just another uh, one on paper here. Um, an ethical question, 
what are we to do as fellow citizens of the United States when we see our sand being used to fracture the earth and the potential side effects that result as in natural gas infiltration of drinking water and earthquakes? <laughs> Not all at once. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure I understand the the question, but it seems to me that there is no absolute question of harm. Uh, virtually every question of harm has to do with an ethically acceptable risk of exposure to harm. I'm always struck by people who talk about the sanctity of life um, when they willfully accept a 65 mile an hour speed limit with full knowledge that that's going to kill 42,000 people a year. I, mean, I, I, I don't say that cynically. I simply say that um, we have to make very close moral choices. And in the finite world we live in, Almost every moral choice involves, if it has causal consequences, some harmful that occur at a certain probability. What you talk about as safe drinking water, for example, is not water that may not kill you. It's water that is a kind of a morally acceptable risk of being killed when you drink it. I mean, that's the way the real world is. And I don't know how you can make the world any different. Um, I think what we're talking about when we're talking about um, these environmental, all environmental impacts is that we're not talk, we're not, we don't live in a pure world and we're not talking about pure water, we're talking about water that most of the time we're not going to die right away and we hope that we aren't chronically exposed at low doses of, of stuff for a long period of time so that we will be injured and harmed you know, in six months. Um, as a philosopher, I, I meditate on that. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know how we can live without being exposed to a risk of harm. I guess the, the question was trying to, to get at the, uh, the connection we have to fracking and how we, we feel as part of that process. Anyone else have, want to answer that? So certainly there are some risks associated with frac sand mining uh, and, and the process of fracking in Marcellus Shale. So, and I think probably a lot of us have seen gas land. I'm certain a lot of YouTube clips with people lighting their tap water on fire. Um, I think some of it's sensationalist, but we do see some contamination of groundwater supplies and well supplies with things like uh, benzene, um, toluene, xylenes, methane, and even some radioactive components. So uh, I thought Ron put it well. You know, we don't live in a perfect world, and so it's, I think, up to us to evaluate the kinds of risks and benefits for this kind of process. But certainly, frac uh, hydraulic fracturing can and has contaminated some groundwater supplies to a certain degree. And I think that's worth putting in the mix when we look at moving forward or not. If I could just turn this to air pollution for a moment. Um, uh, so I heard a disconnect there. Dr. Pierce suggested that it be required that there be air monitoring in the, the vicinity of, of frac sand mines. And then I heard uh, Tom Wallets, is it? Sorry, uh, suggest that the DNR regulations mandated that air monitoring be installed uh, around these mining operations. So my question for for Tom actually is, as per DNR regulations, what what is being monitored? Is it PM10, PM5, PM2.5? Are these data readily available? PM10. PM10. And if these data are readily available, um, what? Why haven't we seen them? I suppose are they are they available? To the general public, we can provide you with the yes. <laughs> we provide you with the data from EOG if you'd like it. I mean, you got it. And I suppose I mean 
sorry to sort of list of questions, but is uh, what is the frequency, spatial frequency of these these uh, these these sampling? What's the mechanism of the sampling? Are they filter samples? Are they uh, at a quarter mile, half mile, right at the source? Uh, how frequently are they monitored and so forth? Every six days, there's one monitor. It's what we believe is downwind. Uh, although we moved it a little away from downwind because there was residences that were concerned, so we moved it closer to the residences. Uh, it goes every six days, and it's a PF10 monitor cited for EPA standards. It's a regular, it's, it's, it's EPA standard for a PF10 monitor. I guess like a ch oh, I'm sorry, Ron, would you like to speak to this? Yeah, I would, I'd like to speak to this one. Um, actually, DNR does not monitor for um, crystalline silica. Uh, in fact, I am, we, Crispin and I, and seven other petitioners are going to be petitioning DNR, the DNR board. Uh, the petition will probably be sent out Monday or Tuesday a long petition, 42, 45 pages, and asking them to establish crystalline silica as a hazardous pollutant, pollutant which they had agreed to do about a few years ago but never did, have them set a standard, health risk standard, for the airborne uh, particulate matter that is called crystalline silica, and to require monitoring for it. Currently, to my knowledge, you can correct me, Tom, if I'm wrong, the only, because EOG complained about it, they were the first company to require, to be, to re, get required for monitoring for uh, crystal silica in the air. And it was actually positioned at a site which was uh, really quite uh, inadequate, I think, from most people's point of view. Uh, only one monitor probably is not enough. Uh, I've heard that uh, the silica uh, processing dry plant up in the town of New Auburn, or in the township actually of Dover, but in the village of New Auburn, uh, may be required to, to monitor uh, the sand uh, coming off out of that plant. But fugitive dust is a kind of a woolly bugger that is very, very difficult and has always scared regulatory agencies from trying to deal with it. If you, if you remember, we had point source pollution first in water, uh, and then we had to deal with this complicated issue of non-point source pollution. And that's where we really are in air. There's about four monitors, air quality monitors around the state, Waukesha, somewhere around Appleton, Milwaukee. Um, well, I don't know, there's one more somewhere. But they're not close to frac sand mines or processing plants. Uh, in fact, they're not close up in this area at all because there aren't many uh, power generating plants with huge smokestacks where you have to you know, measure for coal, dust, and other particular matter that, you know, gets your smog going out there. So we hope that DNR will eventually do this, but right now they, they aren't monitoring or re required to do so as yet. If I could just quickly clarify, um, EOG did not want to have a monitor at the mine site. They negotiated with DNR to have one on the processing site. And it is actually upwind. If you look at the windrose data, the wind comes from the southwest. It's in the southwest corner. I think the DNR had input in saying that's the closest to the residences, and that was one of the factors in determining the mine site. Uh, but EOG is not being required to monitor crystalline silica. And I just want to echo Ron's concern. The DNR does not include fugitive dust when they evaluate a new plant, and it could be up to 50 percent of the dust that's generated from one of these facilities. So I, I continue to, to push them. I know it's difficult to do, but fugitive dust is a very, very important issue, and I would love to see DNR consider that when they look at licensing a new facility. I have a question for the professor that just uh, answered this question. I want to return just for a moment to the ethical question. It seems to me, as we live more and more in the society we're in that is so highly technologized, that we find with reference to nature that more and more ethical questions are arising. And it seems to me that those ethics usually lag behind the technology. And I was struck by the example you used of traffic deaths because it's taken years for us to catch up with the traffic deaths that were due not to the traveling of 65 miles an hour but to the number of drunk drivers on the road. 
And it seems to me in the same way that we have to ask a question here and that it might be, I'm wondering if it wouldn't be a fairer answer to say, given the kinds of studies you're doing, that the ethical question is still under investigation. It's still open. It seems to me that we need to learn to be ethically moderate rather than jumping against the sanctity of life or jumping too quickly before the studies have a chance to help us answer the questions. Uh, yeah, I appreciate your point of view. I think a lot of us share the concern in the room. Uh, as a scientist, health scientist, I look towards places like Europe to have a, 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 a policy called the precautionary principle. And if there is a potential for harm, many European countries will halt until we have enough information to go forward. That, that is a little bit of my concern because we're not requiring silica monitoring. We're actually not requiring monitoring on the processing plants. It's a new, very, very big industry, and there's some potential. Uh, we may find that this was the greatest investment in Wisconsin in 10 years, but we don't know that yet. And, and in my own estimation, we need to really understand what the risks are and put in uh, safeguards and monitors to make sure that we're not endangering the health of, of folks 20 years down the road. I, I can add to that. Yeah, keep, keep in mind, and I think, um, uh, it was also discussed that there is crystalline silica uh, monitoring um, from MSHA, Mine Safety and Health Administration. Once a year, uh, well, they come in and do inspections twice a year. One of those inspections is um, health and safety. They, they actually put monitors very similar to the pump that um, was, was presented earlier uh, in the presentations. And it's a, uh, a personal monitor where uh, the actual employee, the worker, wears it on a lapel and puts the pump on his on his belt and he goes through his, his daily activities. Um, can't deviate from his normal activities. It's, it's pretty strict and they have to um, be tested for eight hours. So there's exposure limits that are that have been established uh, within Mine Safety and Health Administration and, and it's been a result of quite a bit of study through NIOSH um, which, is, which is in Washington DC and they do quite a bit of testing for uh, health and safety um, issues according to all types of industries, not just uh, silica and, and industrial sand issues. There is a, there is a real, uh, is a real problem in, of justice involved in environmental regulation. And for example, uh, look at all the high cap wells, for example, around. Now let's say that we add two more wells that are permitted in DNR Tom will certainly, is, I think, confirm this as well. <clears throat> DNR cannot regulate a water quantity generally. They can just we regulate one well at a time. And we've been trying to get regulations. By we, I mean people are concerned with groundwater quantity. I mean, Madison runs is close to running out of wa enough water for the people that live there. L Little Plover River in, in central sands of Wisconsin dries up every summer now because all the potato fields suck all the water out unless you have torrential rains all summer long, it won't run anymore because of the, the water draw. We are not able to deal with those problems. But one of the real real problems and reasons we aren't able to deal with it is because we can't go back to the old Montana and Wyoming water laws that tell us the first in, last out kind of thing. So that if you if you've been using it for 40 years, you're at the top, you can take out as much as you want, and by the time you get down to the bottom and it's dry, well, that's your problem. You're too far away from it. You know, so we have to learn how, we have to have a rationing policy. How do we ration available well water so that we have an adequate supply? And that's a question politically that we need to face. It's a justice question uh, so that people are treated fairly, and it's a tough nut to crack. It's going to take a while, a lot of discourse, but we're just starting to discuss it. I mean, it's kind of forums like these where these issues arise that makes public discourse possible. I have a number, number of questions in the... I have a question. We live, we live about a quarter of a mile west of, uh, or east of, uh, of a pit that's just been opened over near Downing, Wisconsin. And uh, in, the, in that... Uh, in that pit, they, uh, and of course, with the prevailing westerly winds, we're somewhat concerned about the dust that we might get from that. But also, we're concerned about the water problems. And in this pit, uh, the DNR has okayed them to dig down 15 feet from the water table. 
is is that a, is that a practice that's safe? And and a friend of mine was looking at some of the sand that was in this in this pit, and he noted there were small little uh, copper particles in the sand, and he said that he thought that that could leach into our our water table. And I have a fish farm, and my concern is that they might that it might dry up my source of water by them or, or contaminate my water. Is this a possibility? And what do I do? And who's going to protect me? And who's watching over the, these pits to make sure they do things right? Is it the fox watching the chicken coop? I, I'd like to know. I'm not familiar with the, with the pit you're talking about. And I, I'll tell you, there are uh, frac sand companies that mine below the groundwater level. They actually dredge. Uh, Unima down in Portage is one of the things that they do. You know, it's not the norm, but they will dredge below the water level. But isn't sand a filter to filter out all the impurities that, that come with rainwater and runoff water and this sort of thing? Isn't that the purpose? Or isn't that one of the reasons sure. that we like to have sure. a good Remember, sand buffer? Got, you know, you've got a hole in the ground and then you've got sand going out too. So I mean, if you're talking about filtering, you know, hopefully that sand that's on either side of the pit, the open hole, will clean, clean the water if there's anything in it. I don't, I don't know that they're adding anything. I doubt if there's copper. All of our neighbors are very concerned. No, no one, as it seems to be, in favor of this sand pit, you understand. Well, and, who owns the sand pit? Uh, metallic mining. Isn't that the name of it? Half of the mine is in St. Croix County and half of it's in Dunn County. And they start bigger in Dunn County. But St. Croix County, I, go to the, I went to a meeting in St. Croix County to discuss this thing, and the, and the gentleman that was running the, the meeting there told me, why don't you go to Dunn County and talk about it? Because I don't live in St. Croix County, you know. Well, man, they're right, they're, you know, they're right on my border. They're right on my neck, you know. And, and uh, they're passing rules in St. Croix County and Hudson that are affecting me. And uh, there's nothing I can do about it. Is this a fraction? Yes, it is. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lime, lime quarry that they've, uh, that they've turned into frac sand. Yeah, I, I, I could comment just very briefly. Um, that company is uh, Manthe Construction. They're out yeah. of La Crosse. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times, you know, as, as a mine operator, it's it's also uh, frustrating for me because I have you know neighbors that maybe uh, have issues that don't communicate them with me. And I, the one suggestion I would I would give to you is is to call Manthe Construction and voice your concerns with them as well. And if you haven't yet, I would I would suggest. You do that, and give them a chance to, to respond. We've to given them many, many chances to do this, and it seems to me that they they've just sort of run around the whole thing. Actually, what, in order to get this permit, they uh, they they didn't inform them that they were going to uh, uh, do any frac sand mining. They said that they wanted to uh, get them uh, renew the old mining permit, <coughs> which was for limestone. So the the township okayed that, and they said fine. They didn't know that that they were going to mine sand. Now they have another pit in Wilson that they want to that they want to also mine. This outfit does, but the town chairman said we're putting a hold on this until we find out how bad this downing uh, thing affects the people that live there. There's there's um, a lot of concerns, very, very similar. I mean, you're, you're not the only one that lives next to a sand mine that has has these concerns. The one thing that um, we do when we open up a mine, we approach a township or a county, is that we have to go through, there is a process that you need to go through. Um, public hearing is, is essentially that, that time where issues are brought up and answers have to be uh, satisfied. In order, in order to gain a conditional use permit, and this is, this is where you know, uh, we were talking about townships with ordinances and townships without ordinances, and, and it gets, gets a little complicated, but uh, when you go and, and apply for a conditional use permit, there's a process, a public hearing process, and um, there's a renewal process typically as well. And if there's enough complaints filed at the county level or the township level, then they will call the company to appear before the planning commission or the county board. There is, there is a, a process for that. When, when we go through the uh, permitting process, all, all these issues come up and, and we're able to respond to issues on groundwater, quantity, quality, 
air, uh, blasting, trucks, haul roads, the list is very long. But that's part of the process, and we, we appreciate that also because that opens up the line of communication. So a lot of these issues, a lot of these frustrations, if, if there's a, a mining area, I, you know, it's happened to me before. We have community outreach programs now because of it. We call them uh, community advisory committees or citizens advisory committees where we hold either monthly meetings or quarterly meetings within our communities and we invite um, our neighbors, we invite the public, anybody that's, that's interested in coming to discuss these issues on a regular basis. So that's, that's, our, that's what we do to uh, communicate with our communities. But as far as the, the startup and the permitting and the township and the county, there is a process there that um, the due process as far as the communication. And, and I, I would just suggest that you call the county, call the company, voice your concerns and make sure that they're, they're aware of, of your opinion and how you feel about them, whether you're next to them, and give them an opportunity to respond to that. They're very aware of my opinion, sir. I've had very, very many run-ins of this company for the last 40 years. And uh, they, it started out as a borrow pit where the county just came and got a little bit of dirt there now and then, and then they, suddenly there was a there was a gravel pit there, and uh, we had to, we organized the neighbors just as it was suggested that we do, and we went to the town zoning meetings in St. Croix County, and we had and we're the ones who got this non-metallic mining these non-metallic mining rules put in place in St. Croix County. It was one of the first counties in the state that did that, and uh, we had a seven to seven hour thing. By 7 in the morning till 7 at night for the maximum hours. And what happens, we go to this meeting, and uh, this um, a milestone mineral outfit got a hold of these people in the meeting, apparently ahead of time, because there are a score of uh, complaints from the community, and not one of our, our complaints was addressed. And they said, well, we're going to start running now from 6 in the morning until 10 at night. And they said, well, we'll compromise. We'll go till 9 at night. Well, you know, what kind of a compromise is that when we went from 7 to 7 to six to ten. It's just that whatever the people complained about were just totally disregarded by the by the, the St. Croix County Board. And uh, and everything that the, that the mining outfit wanted got. And I said, well, gee, I smell a rat. Uh -huh. There's just a couple of couple of comments I would have. Number one, I you will find in these sand deposits they're not just sand. There's lead, there's arsenic there could be copper, there could be a number of other heavy metals. Um, um, we have in our, in our ordinance re a requirement that they test for lead, arsenic, and so forth. Now, if you're a, you, you need to really talk with someone who is a municipal lawyer um, who, and who knows environmental law, um, they're hard to find. You could call Paul Kent in Madison in the, in the Stafford Rosenbaum, which is where we, uh, Town of Howard, uh, does all their work with them. They represent us in the mining issues. But you could probably have your own ordinance, which might be more restrictive. We're not zoned, sir. We're you're not zoned? We're then you're chip in Dunn County that's not zoned, and just across is the St. Croix County, and they won't listen to us because we well, can't vote you're against in them. County. Well, then protect yourself with your own licensing ordinance for that portion of the pit that's in Dunn County. Well, they, yeah, they're, they're not going to move into that portion of the pit that's in Dunn County. Oh. They're not going to do that yet. They're just in St. Croix. Well, then you have time to get your act together. I see yeah, but what about, my water? what about my water conditions here? What about what they're doing in St. Croix County? And who's watching over these people? Who's making sure that they obey these rules? Is there any conversation between Dunn County and St. Croix? This is certainly something that could be discussed. I, yeah, I'm sorry. That's okay. I understand your frustration, but let's have you address that with, with them. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I have one, a written comment, or a written question. Uh, can, and here it is. Can someone comment on the direction of profits from the mines? Are they funneled up and out of the community, or do they end up in the pocket? about one percenter, or do they stay here? Uh, I guess I'll answer that one. <laughs> I can't answer any questions on uh, revenue or profit. The, um, truthfully, as far as um, 
Fairmont Minerals, I can't speak for other companies. We're an employee-owned company. So as far as profit, the profit sharing that goes on is based upon that employee ownership. Uh, we're a corporation based out of Ohio. So the profits of the company are shared throughout the corporation. So Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, we have operations in you know, Texas and, and uh, uh, Oklahoma. Um, Detroit. So, you know, when it comes to a business, you know, business op, business op, businesses operate uh, in a way that they feel necessary to, to move funds from uh, one capital investment to the other. Um, we're a growing company, so we're reinvesting uh, essentially our profits back into into our company for future growth. Here's a, another written one. You can keep the microphone. How much does Fairmont pay for financial assurance to pay for restoration? A restoration, I'm assuming, is uh, reclamation. Yeah, reclamation. We um, all all of our all of our mine plans or all of our mining operations have to go through uh, two pri you know, primary phases of an ordinance, and that's uh, stormwater control and erosion control, as well as uh, reclamation uh, reclamation ordinance and, and uh, reclamation planning. So the reclamation planning process in Dunn County, uh, like Tom had mentioned, Amanda with the uh, Dunn County Land Conservation Department, uh, manages the NR-135, which is the um, uh, regulation in the state of Wisconsin for reclamation. And we have to uh, essentially produce a mine plan and also produce a, a reclamation plan and a stormwater plan. And all those plans tie together. And the plan shows, as we mine through the property, what stage and point we are, and also what stage is the reclamation going on at that time as well. Um, Dunn County Land Conservation comes out and does annual audits and works with the uh, plant manager at the facility, does surveys, she's calculating overburden, how much, how much effective acreage is there. Um, they know the buildings, the foundations, the uh, processing equipment, and they've calculated a bond that's required, an surety bond that's required to state that if this plant in Menominee and this company decided to uh, pack up and leave and left the lights on, everything was in place, what kind of bond, what kind of insurance, surety, insurance policy would the county need to come back in and reclaim the property according to the plan that was uh, worked up at the beginning of the uh, application phase? And so every year that's updated. So as we start reclaiming property in Menominee, our effective acreage will go down. Our, actually, our bond will go down. So right now our bond is going up because we, we haven't gotten to the point where we finish development of phase one and phase two, which is in the reclamation plan, where reclamation starts occurring immediately after um, a period that's going to occur in about two years. So at that point, our bond will stop growing uh, and remain, and there's inflation and calculations and that sort of thing, but as, as far as my, my understanding, and Tom may be able to comment on this as well, is that Wisconsin manages this with all non-metallic uh, mining operations, and there is a, a requirement for that reclamation plan and that surety bond to be in place. How much, how much do you pay per acre? As, as far as acre? How, how much it's, it's based on cubic yards. Of material that needs to be brought back in to reclaim the property to a, a certain topography that's listed within the reclamation plan. The demolition of the buildings is listed in there. Um, the uh, removal of the driveway. You know, so it's pretty detailed. But in your permit, bond. you have a set amount that you're required to bond for per acre. That's how the counties do it. Yeah, and and then there's yeah, then there's that end of it. But there's some details within our bond here in Menominee that go beyond that. Beyond that, yes. How much is it per acre? As far as the bond itself, yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't really tell you as far as how much it is. It's enough money to cover the reclamation process, which is removal of the buildings, the front gate even, all the light poles, the driveway, you know, all the berms that are there, topsoil clay, placed back in uh, reclamation as the plan states. How long do you mine for afterwards? Sure the bundle mine, for example, now it's just like the river again. I'm sorry, as far as monitoring the... What happened until we start getting some leaching or something here? You started off, and all of a sudden the Red Cedar River has got all these 
pollutants in it. Yeah, that's, you know, as far as any pollutants from the site, if, if you know, we're, we're not using anything on the site that's reviewed through the permit process. So if there is a chance that that could happen, <coughs> then I would assume that there would be some, um, I guess, ongoing uh, surveys done and the bond was st would still stay in place or a bond would still stay in place. But I, we, we're, not, we're not under that sort of bonding because we don't have that kind of chemicals. We don't use any chemicals on, on site uh, that would you know, pollute the aquifer. Yes, uh, I just had a couple, um, uh, one point to make that um, I think the most important thing for us as community members um, is to stay um, in communication. So I'd suggest um, I will start a Facebook page, simple thing, and um, if you guys like, would like to write the name down, Citizens for Sandmine Accountability, um, everyone could go to that and we could stay in touch. and. Um, as far as zoning laws and such. And I had a question. Um, the December 1st town boards meeting, I believe in Altoona, I'm not sure the exact location. Um, I was wondering if any of you guys could touch upon what they'll be talking about there. I know it's specified towards um, zoning regulations for sand mines. And um, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming, um, especially the representative from the sand mine, because obviously you care about our community. It's the people that um, own the companies that would like to take advantage of our community instead of give back to our communities that aren't here, that um, that we should be worried about, the ones that prey upon the poor, and um, people that are losing their houses and their lands. So I'd like to thank um, the representative um, for giving a presentation and for letting, you know, giving us insight on the actual process of sand mining from the insider point of view. And the, yeah, the December 1st. And so, yeah, Citizens for Sand Mine Accountability, please go to that Facebook page uh, in about a week or so. Okay, it's almost 9.20. I think if we take two more quick questions and then we'll wrap it up. Jeremy, do you have one for someone who's going to I'd like to know, especially as the gentleman asked about his fish farm, has anyone thought out what kind of implications this is going to have for Wisconsin's tourist industry? I mean, is the fishing going to be okay? Uh, I have a map from July with sites and proposed sites. They're dotted all over the state. Um, yesterday I went and took the uh, new and proposed sites from Eau Claire and Chippewa counties. And I tell you what, I, I'm i just worried, how do you folks think this is going to affect the, the tourist industry? I mean, this looks like a lot of pimples to me on the landscape. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in fisheries biology, but one uh, important uh, suggestion I've had from folks I know in Trout Unlimited is actually to look at the stream levels before a sand mine processing plant is put in and ensure that they stay at the same level. As we've talked earlier about this, uh, sand is very porous and used as a cleaning um, uh, component of water. So the fact that so much sand is being removed and moved could indeed affect groundwater tables as well as stream levels. So again, recommendation I had from friends of mine in Trouts Unlimited is to measure now to look at the stream levels and look and see if there's any change once these kind of facilities come online. been uh, considered a model mine for the area. What violations and problems have you encountered? Uh, your mining operations um, since opening that have had to be, what, what mining operations since opening and problems have you had that have had to be corrected? And uh, do you notify the public about any of these problems? You know, as, as far as uh, Menominee facility, all, all three of the uh, facilities that I manage, um, there haven't been any violations. Um, you know, as far as our permits are concerned, uh, whether that's the high capacity well uh, permit that we have, a stormwater permit that we have, the air permit that we have, um, pollution control permit, um, and then as well as our local permits, our conditional use permits within 
uh, the townships and and the counties. So I can't comment on any any violations. I, I'm not aware of any violations from any of our uh, you know, competitor mines um, as well. But you know, maybe Tom can comment on that if there is such a thing. None for the Benomini mine. I think we had issues with the Maiden Rock mine before you guys purchased it. I know we had issues down there. Yeah, they're all public records. No, the um, as far as the regulation, there is there is an accountability process within the permits uh, that happens. There's there's uh, actual reports, maintenance reports, paperwork that we have to file uh, with the DNR on a regular basis. There's uh, the DNR has the absolute authority and right to come on site at any any point in time um, without without reason. So, you know, as far as the regulations, we are we are held accountable and. Um, the largest accountability uh, system that we have is our, our local communities, our neighbors. Um, and I'm not talking about necessarily the regulations, the permits. Uh, this goes above and beyond. Um, so if a company is listening to their neighbors, addressing uh, concerns, listening to issues, um, that in itself is, is a regulation um, as well. So. And if you'd like, you can go on the DNR website uh, and go to the environmental air portion. You can look at any air permit for any facility in the state. And I think if you looked at some of the permits, you would see that there, some industries would tell you that they're quite burdensome. Um, they're lengthy, and there's a lot of conditions. And so you know, all of our permits have a lot of monitoring in, uh, maybe not as much as some people would like. Maybe other people would like less. but. Uh, uh, take a look at some of them. Okay, my question is to the uh, retired professor. I'm sorry, I forget your name. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering, how did you handle the bonding for, um, for example, the picture that Tom showed about a, uh, a breakthrough of a dam? If there is any type of uh, significant spill at uh, some, of the, I know not this plant in Menominee, but uh, coatings plants that are being proposed in the area that do use chemicals, etc. Uh, what was the amount of your bond that you negotiated with the companies? We did, not, we, we did not take a bonding approach. We took an enforcement approach. Okay, again, what so does that, that mean? We did not take a bonding approach. Mm -hmm. We took an enforcement approach, which in effect says that <coughs> if you, uh, let's say you're uh, a berm, berms around this mine are 25 feet high for dust control purposes and the like, uh, noise purposes. Um, if they wash out, which they did, and any materials go on to neighboring lands, they have to, um, as part of our agreement, clean it up, clean it up pronto. And they get, you know, so many days to do this. And if they don't clean it up, the town goes in and cleans it up and assigns a cost to them. Uh, what I'm relating to is that picture that you said it went into a trout stream? Correct. And I don't think that was ever remedied? It was eventually, yes, remedied now. Okay. They were given three citations for that. Okay. I just wanted to caution that I think I heard at the last county meeting, I think our bond is only $4,000. $5,000? What was the amount that she mentioned? Tom, do you remember? It was some minimal amount. What am I mistaken on? Typical per acre. The fine. Okay, so besides the fine, is there clauses that require the remediation of that type of spill? That's perfect. The spill did not occur in that. No, I know. I know it didn't, but I'm looking ahead so that we're protected as well. Okay. I think generally, I think, for example, blasting, we have our own blasting ordinance. <coughs> Because I'm telling you, I called I called down to the Department of Commerce. They, they had to find somebody who knew what it was. When I talked to him, he hadn't read it in 45 years. I mean, you know, didn't know anything about it either, even though he was in charge of it. But, uh, regulating at a distance 
is worthless. It's the local regulation, I think, that's the only viable way of protecting yourselves. I think town government has to get its act together and start protecting its citizens. Yeah, the uh, Department, of, Department of Commerce, Wisconsin Department of Commerce,